Since the dawn of time, man has been curious. And for almost as long, the Vibes Broadcast Network has sought the truth. Investigate. Discuss. Explore. Okay. Maybe in other episodes, but this one is just... Listen to the Vibes. The views and opinions of our guests may not necessarily reflect those of the host or the Vibes Broadcast Network. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Listen to the Vibes. And I'm very privileged to have the great J.J. French here with me, guitar player for the band Twisted Sister. And uh, he's got a book out, and we're going to talk about that and just learn a little bit about him. Uh, well, uh, born and raised in New York City, living in New York City still. And I um, uh, was born in 1952, which makes me 70. And um, uh, I started Twisted Sister when I was 20. So next uh, January will be the 50th anniversary of the band. Wow. Uh, which is incredible. Uh, to, you know, the, the bands that came out in 1973, Aerosmith, uh, Kiss, Judas Priest, ACDC, and Twisted Sister. I don't think any of us would have um, predicted a 50-year career back in those days. When we were 20 years old, we would have said we would have lasted five years, and here we are 50 years later. Um, what differentiates Twisted Sister from those other bands, however, and they're all great bands, phenomenal bands, and great live acts, you know, Aerosmith, Kiss, Judas Priest, ACDC, what can you say? The difference between us and those bands, however, is that we have a song which is so universally popular that it kind of transcends the entire music industry and becomes a cultural artifact and a cultural phenomenon. That song is we're not going to take it. So if you ask a 10-year-old kid to sing an ACDC song or Kiss song or Judas Priest song or an Aerosmith song, they're not going to know it. But if you ask them to sing we're not going to take it, you can bet your ass they're going to sing we're not going to take it. And, and it's become a, a rallying cry for all sorts of political organizations around the world, left and right side of it. It doesn't really matter. It's also the most licensed song in the history of heavy metal. So we're in more movies, TVs, commercials. You've probably seen it in a million commercials. I heard it in a million commercials because people license it. Um, we license it to movies. We, we want to keep that song out there. It's important that we keep the song out there. So we make it available for people, uh, especially independent movie producers, uh, because it's important to keep the song out. That's how you keep your longevity as a band out. Uh, the band um, went through multiple changes before the band made it to the version that you all know with Dee and Eddie and me. That was the 14th version of the band that made it. Uh, 10 years after the band started. My book, Twisted Business, which is out now and available on Amazon, um, is, tells the story, as well as the documentary, which has been out for a long time, We Are Twisted Fucking Sister. My book, Twisted Business, really tells my side, the business side of the story, because what I do is, I'm not just a guitar player, I'm the manager as well. And um, uh, So in the process of becoming a manager, I've learned a lot of things. And those lessons I learned, I turned into a teaching method called the Twisted Method of Reinvention, which I talk about in the book. I take the word twisted, T-W-I-S-T-E-D. I turn each letter into a, a lesson. And I teach it when I do my motivational speaking. It stands for tenacity, wisdom, inspiration, stability, trust, excellence, and discipline. T-W-I-S-T-E-D. So it's all laid out in the book, which, like I said, is available on Amazon now. And, and um, I can take you through all those lessons. I mean, the point is that the band succeeded because the band had a business model in mind. And a lot of people don't consider bands necessarily businesses. They just think we're just a bunch of people that get together, you know, right. get high, whatever, you know, party and somehow make it. And that's not how Twisted made it because we didn't party. And you couldn't drink and do drugs in my band. So unlike all these other bands that you all read about and all think that they're all stoned all the time, which they very well may be. I don't know because I don't know them. Um, we didn't. So we had very strict rules about drinking and doing drugs. And the band went through all these different versions because we fired people who were high all the time. Yeah, yeah. They couldn't keep up with our incredibly difficult and hard history uh, in order to make it. We played more than any other band that I know of. We've done more shows. I'm at like 9,200, something like that. At this wow. Point. So uh, yeah, and that's how you become great, by doing it all the time. But it's a tough road and most people can't handle the workload 
Well, y'all, y'all had to be very persistent because I, I did watch the documentary and and the the chances that came up, and then for some reason, kind of something always happened before y'all finally made it big. And I think the last ones that the guy had passed away on the airplane. That was one of them. <laughs> Where the guy, the, the red company guy, had uh, had a heart attack on the plane back to Germany. I mean, that was one of dozens of stories, you know, just like it was snatched from us, you know, just at the point we thought we were going to get signed. And obviously, we got signed, and obviously, we became famous and world famous, and that's why you know us. But um, the road to getting there was next to impossible. And um, I think the story that we tell on how we persevered. Um, is, a, is a life lesson for anybody. It doesn't matter if you're a rock band or you own know, a shoe company or you're just raising a family. I mean, we um, these rules of success, the twisted method of reinvention, speak to all of that. You know, we were we were turned down more times in a bed sheet in a whorehouse and come back more times afraid of Google. You know, <laughs> so. Uh, you know, we, we were counted out as being dead. Like we were, you know, like, like soap opera guys who get killed and come back and they get killed and come back and they like Freddie, you know, like this, we just kept coming back, you know, much to the chagrin of a lot of labels who rejected us because they thought, Oh God, Tim, just makes us sick of hearing them. Like, like can they just go away? <laughs> right. you know, can they just go away. Finally, they suck. And, you know, you would go, when you, when you, when you live long enough, you've been through enough experiences, you know, um, I'm not so cynical to tell you we didn't suck. You know, sometimes when someone tells you you suck, you know, you do suck, you know, and and then you have to figure out why you suck. And then you have to learn a lesson from that and figure out how to do it. And the book details how to process this rejection and how to keep coming back and coming back and coming back by processing the rejection and taking out of it what you need to and then moving forward. But here's the best way I can describe it. When you're watching the Olympics and you're watching, like, say, the skier on the mountain, you know, and the guy wins the gold medal, the girl wins the gold medal, you know why they won that gold medal? Because they've been, they get up at four o'clock in the morning every day for like 10, 15 years, right? Right. And that's, they become great. Now, you and I are on our couch. We're not getting up at four o'clock in the morning going on that mountain, but that they are. They yeah. are. And that's how come they got good, you know? Oh, you go to a concert and you watch some violinist first chair at the Philharmonic, you know, and mind blowing, you know? Well, how did they get mind blowing? Because they've been practicing 10 hours a day for 15 years. Mm -hmm. You and I aren't doing that. They are. And that's why they're the first chair, right? When you become a successful anything, it's because you've done it a lot. So when people ask me to describe how much work, we put into it just about everybody who listens to you is a music fan and probably knows some local bands and probably has kids who are playing in bands. So the discussion I have with young musicians these days, like 20 year old musicians, they say, JJ, give me some advice. You know, and I go, well, how old are you? Uh, 21, 22. How long has your band been together? Uh, Two years, three years. How many shows you play? Well, we played a lot, man. We played like 50, 60 shows. I go, oh, yeah, it's like 50, 60, 45 minute shows, right? In the last two or three years, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, here's in the first 30 months, 30 months, which is two and a half years of Twisted Sisters existence, we played 3,500 shows. You get that? That's in the first 30 months. We played five shows a night, six nights a week. It's crazy. Honestly, and that's how you get good. So before D even joined, I had already had 3,500 shows on my belt. D joined, we added another 5,000 shows. That's 8,500. And then we went off and toured the world. So when people say, how come you guys are so good? How come you can just do it like on command? It's because we can do it on command. Uh, you can hate Twisted Sister, I don't care. You can think we suck. That's fine. But I will tell you this. Not only is we're not going to take it the most licensed song in the history of heavy metal, there's only about 30 acts in the world that a promoter would trust 100,000 people to in a festival. And you have to be great because if you can't suck at a festival and you can't suck when you headline the festival because that means your reputation and the festival's reputation goes down the toilet. So who headlines these things? Iron Maiden, 
Kiss, mm-hmm. ACDC, for example, Guns N' Roses, you know, those kinds of bands, right? Twisted Sister. So we're one of only 30 or so acts that a promoter can trust 100,000 people to and know that we're going to put on the best show and have people walk out of the festival. Wow. That was amazing. And that's because we are good at what we do. Now we retired in 2016. Uh, I'd gotten tired at that point. And um, the band reunited in 2003 after taking 12 years off. And we were only going to reunite for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. That lasted three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It lasted 14 years. <laughs> after 14 years of the reunion. It's like a kiss reunion, but it never ends. You know? <laughs> yeah. Or a Leonard Skinner reunion that never ends, or a Rolling Stone reunion that never ends, or the Who, you know, that, that the Who's farewell tour has been going on since 1980. You know, Rolling <laughs> yeah. Stone, their farewell tour started in 1972, still going on. So we did, we were 14 years in, and I, and I just said, man, I just, you know, I want to retire. So. Well, I know before we started the show, you and I had shared some some personal uh, tragedy stories, and uh, I won't get into that. But the whole point of the show being trying to inspire people and motivate them to be successful with whatever it is they want to do. And a band like Twisted Sister, who I, I like, I said I watched the documentary and the things that y'all went through, and you did, you never gave up. And this life can kick you in the teeth. And I mean, there's all kinds of setbacks, but the, the key is just don't ever give up. And so if, if those lessons are in that book, I mean, I, I definitely want to read it because, I mean, I, I told you all the things that I went through and that's just a little tiny bit of what we've gone through. But, um, what, what motivated you to, to write the book? Well, you know, when I started out, I was just a guitar player. I wasn't a manager or anything. I was just a guitar player in a band. I thought, hey, you know, I'll be in a band and hopefully the band will be successful. I'll make some money. And um, you know how like Disney sells this bullshit happily ever after? You know, the prince kisses the girl and she wakes up and it's happily. It's never happily ever after. You know what I mean? Life ain't happily ever after. Life can be challenging ever after, but it ain't happily ever after because everybody's got good, bad stories. You know, I don't care what part of the political spectrum you're in. I don't care what religion you believe in. Everyone's got good and bad. You know what I mean? You're, everyone's affected by the same forces out there. You know, the good things that can happen to you and the bad things that can happen to you. The tragedies and the successes, you know, all that. So in the early days of the band, um, I, you know, I was a drug dealer and a drug addict when I was 15 to 20. So I kicked it all myself one day, one day, seriously, I just did it. I, I describe it in the book. Um, I just made a decision that, that enough was enough was enough. And it was enough. And I stopped all before Twisted started. So when Twisted, when I entered the band, Twisted Sister, I was totally straight and never got high after that either. So, but that band was a bunch of alcoholics. And I didn't know, I never drank. So I didn't know what drinking was. I still, to this day, I've had five beers in my entire life. I just don't like it. And I'll drink wine, but I'm not, I don't like alcohol. I don't like the taste of alcohol. And so within the first two years of that band, the singer and the, the drummer got into a real serious fight at a club, in, in a bar. And the singer pulled a loaded gun out on the drummer, threatened to kill him. And, and I was 22. And to me, it was like, welcome to the world of, re- of reality. Like this wasn't rock and roll. This was life and death. So, we fired the singer. He didn't pull the trigger. Thank God. And we fired, and thank God. And, and the guitar and his buddy, the guitar player, they, they both left and we replaced them with, with uh, two guys. And those guys were basically methadrine addicts. And we didn't know that either. And then they, they got fucked up and a couple of members conspired, sold the truck from us, held it for ransom. We paid off the truck and then they smashed the gear. And that was bad. And then we went through a succession of players that were just drug addicts, alcoholics, and keep firing them all. And when I hired D, I said to him, do you drink or do drugs? He says, no, in fact, I hate that. And I went, you're my kind of guy. Because right? our work schedule's really hard. We can't get fucked up and never in his life did it. We hired Mark Mendoza on bass finally 
he hated drugs and alcohol. Like that was my kinds of guys because we had a very tough workload. But the point is, is that nothing prepared me for, the only thing that prepared me for life was the fact that I was born in New York City. I was a pretty tough street kid and I was a drug dealer. So I kind of had seen a lot of shit talk my way. I had two drug busts, almost murdered six times and got away with it. And, uh, I had guns put to my head. I had knives put to my throat. I, I was robbed in elevators in Harlem as a teenager. You know, I was pretty out of know, Every drug you could possibly imagine. I sold drugs in Europe. I was a really crazy guy. And, and when I came through it all, I was like, wow, man, I didn't get arrested. I have no police record. I did. And now I'm straight. And wow, boy, I lucked out. But meanwhile, meanwhile, most of my friends were dead by the time I was 20. Yeah. My inner core group of friends were either in mental institutions, hospitals, or dead. My girlfriend was the great granddaughter of Robert E. Lee. Oh, wow. That was the yeah. high school I went to. <laughs> she, she dated me to piss her mother off because I was a Jewish drug dealer from New York. So that would just check every box and piss my mom off, you know. She eventually, you know, she, you know, wound up marrying a heroin dealer. And her life was tragic. Kid was murdered. Kid was murdered, and she was she was raped and left for dead, and that was a horrible tragedy. And um, uh, you know, so I'm watching all of this going on with other people's lives, and how uh, the whole scene was just horrifically collapsing inward. So I had no interest in wanting to be with people who got fucked up. And so as the band developed and the the guys had drug habits, we just kept firing them. You know, I would say to a guy, "You sure you want to join this band? Because we don't approve of drugs and alcohol now." You can imagine how hard it is to try to find a guy to play in a band if you tell him you don't like drugs and alcohol. That's why you're in a band. Right. You're in a band to party. You don't join a band to join the freaking like Jehovah Witness group. You know what I mean? <laughs> this had nothing to do with religion. This this had to do with the fact we had a hard work schedule, you know? We didn't we couldn't we couldn't absorb drinking and, and we couldn't absorb people getting over a hangover. You know what I mean? It was too much work to do. Yeah. I, like if you wanted a party and I didn't know about it and it never affected your play, I don't think I would have cared. But I have to tell you, when you're that together all the time, you know when people are wasted and you know when they're not wasted. So I had band members collapse in epileptic seizures on drug overdoses in front of radio station executives. Golly. You know, I didn't sign on for any of that shit, you know. When I was 22, when, when that gun was pulled out, when that gun was pulled out on the, on the drummer by the singer, that week my mom died. And oh that my, my girlfriend at that point in my life left me. And, and I, I went spiraling into a severe black hole depression where I, can, I contemplated suicide. And um, I should have gotten professional help. I did not. But what I did do was I started keeping a diary of my mental state. And that diary lasted 15 years. And that diary was the foundation of my book because I was able to go back and read about how I was dealing with all these issues. And as we solved all these problems, as time went on, the more problems you solve, the better off you get at solving problems. And um, it gives you encouragement and validates your existence. So I became adept at being able to deal with trauma. Uh, and uh, if a band is nothing more than a business, and every business is like an airplane that's flying, you know, and there's a little turbulence, you know, and then there's a lot more turbulence and then like there's more turbulence. If you look at turbulence as it relates to a business, you know, you got challenges, you got crises and you have catastrophes and delineating the differences between them all is something that I learned how to do as a byproduct of being a manager of the band. So um, I wound up developing business survival techniques, which people don't think you do in a rock band. You know, they think that a rock band succeeds because of sex, drugs, rock and roll, and fairy dust. You know, you make a deal with the devil or something, you become famous. They don't think it's because you apply business techniques to succeed. Mm -hmm. And I can't speak for Motley Crue or Aerosmith or Kiss. I can't because, I, you know, they have their own journey on how they got where they got. I can only talk about Twisted Sister right. and how we survived. That's all I can talk about. So... The book details um, my ability to overcome enormous challenges. And um, 
understanding the difference between proactive and reactive chaos as it, as it pertains to businesses. I know it sounds kind of technical and sounds weird because you don't expect it to come from a musician. You know what I mean? But <laughs> Uh, when I tell you it's business, it's business, it's business. And meanwhile, you know, so we became so anti-drug. And because we were anti-drug, I didn't hang out with anybody with the drugs because I just couldn't stand hanging out. So we were touring with all these major bands in the world, you know, everybody you can possibly imagine we played with. And we'd be invited to parties and I, me and Dee would never go. Like, why am I going? I'm not going to get high. I'm married. I'm not fucking around. Dee's married. He's not fucking around. I know it sounds like these dudes are like Jehovah Witnesses. You know? <laughs> to bust someone's bubble but it just wasn't that it was just like we weren't into it you know we were into working putting on the best show we could put on go to sleep get a good night's sleep because we got a show tomorrow okay so we became dedicated to the proposition that the fans dollar that they're spending on us is valuable right you know because the night that you see us is the one night you're seeing us if I suck that night I can rationalize and go, well, there's always tomorrow night, but it doesn't do shit for you. You spent a lot of money to see us that night. You maybe hired babysitters. You drove. You spent money on gasoline. You bought food, whatever you did. I can't suck that night. I got to be as great that night as I have to be every night because I owe it to you as a consumer to give you the best show I can give you. That's as simple as that. I mean, it's pretty basic business. Do you know what I mean? You want to right. give your, you want to give your buyer the best product. Oh, for and sure. Then, again, people go, well, man, for a band, that's pretty interesting. You know, I know you guys just like party out, dude. And, well, you know what? I wish I could fake party out, dude, but I couldn't. It was what it was. You know, it's real shit, real life. We became overwhelmed with the desire to make sure that you, the fan, got a fabulous show every single night. Never phoned it in, never pretended. I can't do that if I'm recovering from a heavy bout of drinking the night before. Right. Or, you know, partying or whatever stuff. You know, I, I started listening to heavy metal when I was about 12. That's really kind of when it, the, the hair metal thing kind of kicked off. And uh, all of us wanted to emulate all the, the rock stars. So we, I started out, you know, drinking, smoking a little pot and all that stuff and just to kind of fit in with the group. And before I knew it, it turned out to be a, a full blown addiction. I mean, it was, I, I could, it'd be quicker for me to tell you the drugs that I didn't do than the ones that I did. You know what I mean? I got that. I got that hundred <laughs> percent. Remember I'm an ex drug addict. Deal. <laughs> Exactly what you know. I'm not like D and Mark never got hot. So when you talk to them, they have no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> but, I know, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Okay. Because it was a contest of how fucked up you could get. That was my crew. I mean, oh, yeah. I grew up in the 60s. I grew up during the hippie generation, 1967, 1972, and you could go see Led Zeppelin for three dollars, Jimi Hendrix for three dollars, or a dollar in Central Park if you couldn't afford three bucks. You could see The Grateful Dead. I mean, Jerry Garcia gave me a tab of acid. Do I have to give you a more official s statement than that? <laughs> Garcia at a Dead concert. I saw The Dead, you know, 27 times. I, I mean, wow. with pig. I mean, with pig pen from 1968 to 1972. I was a fucking heavy, heavy druggy fucking lunatic, you know. And it's astonishing that I'm alive. Oh, and it's I know the feeling that uh, it's so I'm, I'm so focused in on business, you know, because that's really, you know, really what it is. But anyway, you were saying so you were telling. Right. So you're you're out there doing every drug on the planet. Earth oh, and anything I could get my hands on, basically. And we wanted to be like the, the rock stars. But then when I, I'll, I'll kind of cut into this when. Um, when I was about 25, I was, I mean, I was drinking really bad, um, you know, cocaine, the whole nine yards. And, and I was, anyway, I was an exterminator at the time. And I went to this guy's house, man, he's, you know, all tatted up, long hair, motorcycle, you know, he, he was a, a biker in, in a gang. And I mean, that, that's, that was my people, you know, so I'm, striking up a conversation with him and in the middle of it he says uh 
hey man uh do you go to church anywhere man that threw me for a loop you know this guy was an ex-bandito and wow. he's talking to me about church and uh I got to thinking, man, if this guy can go to church, then I can too. Well, that put my life in a new direction where I got off the drugs and the alcohol. And then I learned stories of like Gene Simmons didn't drink or do drugs. And, you know, I'm hearing that you didn't do drugs when you were in the band. And then, you know, the other band members stay clean. 50 years ago. Right, right. 50 years ago, right? That's the last time I heard it. Okay. I just think if we had heard more stories like that, maybe some of us wouldn't have gone the path that we went. Instead, yeah. we just knew about the party bands, you know, Motley yeah, Crue. And label. the record labels told us, don't tell anybody. That's crazy. It'll ruin your reputation. And I said, that's fucked up. And they said, look, you don't have to, you don't have to say you don't do it. Just don't talk about it. Because, you know, we don't want to fuck it. But you want to see a cool picture? Here's me in my super hippie days <laughs> nice right you get you get the drift right yes yeah. sir <laughs> that photo i'm on i'm fucked up on lsd and that photo oh way. my god no way <laughs> my mother took that photo with a polaroid camera wow anyway um yeah so we were told don't talk about it i mean i don't know if kiss was told that too i don't know because i know gene and paul didn't get high uh, and I know they're famous for it. Did, did they ever talk about not getting hired? They never talked about it. I, I, I found out about it years later, and I think it was on a documentary or something. When Gene had said something along the lines of he didn't like to take any kind of drugs whatsoever, and, and he didn't like to drink. And I mean, he wouldn't even take a shot of uh, NyQuil because it had alcohol in it. So, like, I mean, these were my heroes. You know, you guys were my heroes. Ted Nugent never did. He talked yeah, about Ted it. Nugent. Yeah, Ted Nugent talked about it too. Oh, straight. I mean, I, I don't agree with him politically, but he, he came out and he said he didn't get high. You know what I mean? It was like, you know, so I appreciate that. I, I do appreciate that part of it. He admitted it. Finally, at some point, I said to D, I I said, let's just talk about it. Somebody asks, tell them. I don't want a kid to get fucked up because they think they're doing me a favor. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? They think they're emulating me. No, 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 no. That's not how it goes. I, I, I couldn't live with myself. Yeah, people do it to fit in, and then they think they look cool when they do it, and then it gets to be a habit. And before you know it, you know, life's either taking you or you're in jail or, you know, something. I mean, I had a heart attack when I was 36 from all those years of drinking and drugs. So, wow, wow. wow. No shit. You had a heart attack at 36. Wow. Yes, sir. Ruined my marriage, too. Wow. That's heavy, man. Yeah. So, you know, I think we should have we, we should have been told that there were guys out there that didn't do all that stuff. And I think maybe, I mean, not everybody would probably feel the same way, but somebody like me would have said, wow, those guys can do it. I can do it. Well, you, think, never know. you never know who you can affect. And, and, and it's a cliche if I can help one person. You know, if I can help one person. I mean, look, I'm a prostate cancer survivor, so I do a lot of prostate cancer interviews. And uh, Rob Halford has prostate cancer. And he's oh. going to be, I'm going to be interviewing him for a prostate cancer special. And, um, you know, and I was, didn't want to talk about it at first. And I said, that's bullshit. You have to talk about it. Guys have to hear it. If one guy goes to get tested, if one guy does, and I can say that dude's life, then I'm going to do it. You know? So I talk about it all the time. And I had two heart operations on top of everything else. Oh, wow. Stints? No, no. I had atrial fibrillation, which is an electrical oh. malfunction. But the, the operation almost killed me. It involved catheterization. When they took the catheters out the first time, they tore my heart muscle, flooded my lungs with 400 cc of blood, collapsed my lungs, put in the ICU. Oh, my God days and they didn't cure me and then i got cured three years later my daughter has uh uveitis which is a rare eye disease which is the leading cause of blindness among girls in america she has that we raise money for her foundation for that so you know like you learn about this shit and you try to educate people mm -hmm.
take a licking but keep on ticking, huh? Got no choice, dude. Yeah. Well, and I, I appreciate that because there's been times where I've ready, I was ready just to give it up, and something just clicked one day and said, "Hey, you got things to live for." And especially, you know, we got my grandkids and my kids, and you know, I want to help people. And it seems like that's the same thing you're doing. So we're like minded there. And I, you know, I, I really appreciate you coming on and talking about all this. I think people need to be aware. Any plans to uh, get the band back together again? Just re retired for good, huh? Yeah. I mean, I know it's cynical to think that bands forever will never ever really retire like heavyweight boxers you know i'm retiring then i come back but uh, i walked off stage in 2016 our drummer died in 2015 aj and, and i then i just decided after that i really uh, that took the heart out of it for me i loved playing with aj he was such a great drummer and that took the heart out so um but, you know, I'm not going to say never. I said never once before we got back together. Again. So, you know, we in the book, I describe how come we got back together because of 9-11. Um, when 9-11 occurred, we were all affected by 9-11 because we all lost people or had new people who lost people because we're all from New York City. So everybody in New York City kind of knew somebody. You know? Like my daughter's third grade teacher's husband was died in, the, in it. My guitar player had a, two members of his family in the buildings. They both got out. Um, but there's all these stories. So anyway, we, we reunited with Ace Freely, Overkill, Sebastian Bach, uh, and Sebastian Bach um, to do a, an anthrax, to do a benefit for the New York City Police and Fire Department that brings civil liberties, uh, civil uh, emergency uh, workers. And so when we reunited, we, uh, the word got out the band had reunited. We didn't reunite to get it back together. We reunited to help raise money for the foundation. And so I didn't know what the effect would be, but the word got out and all of a sudden, everyone in Europe was like, oh man, they're back, they're back, they're back. And, and we got offered to headline these festivals that we were never headlining in the early days. So we, uh, we came back and had a great 14 year run, we released a Christmas album called Twisted Christmas that became very successful. A whole slew of DVDs and we recorded Stay Hungry, we released Still Hungry, a single called 30. We did an awful lot of work. The Christmas, the Christmas album is the most successful metal Christmas album ever, Twisted Christmas, and um, had a great run. But uh, you know, everything kind of just at some point you just get tired. Yeah, I can unless imagine. You, unless you're Keith Richards, you know. <laughs> I think he's been dead for years. It's just the drugs know, keep him right. going. <laughs> the coffee my father used to make. One day he gave me a cup of it. I said, "No, you've been dead for years, haven't you?" <laughs> doesn't know. The shit was like taking liquid methadone. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the fuck he was drinking. Like, he gave me this black coffee one day. I took it. It's like, I like, like doing blow or something. Like, said, okay. That's, that's the way the coffee is in Louisiana. Man, I took a drink of that and I was ready to run around the world. <laughs> but, you know, when will this, is this live now or is this coming? No, we're, we're recording. So it's on that. So in other words, what people are hearing it, they're hearing it in real time. Like today. no, no, no. They'll, they'll, I will have it uh, edited and up today. Uh, oh, because I just want to tell people if you're in the Dallas area, I'll be playing in Dallas this, time. Um, this coming Friday, uh, this coming Sunday, May 1st at the Dallas market center with, uh, with the uh, Texas blues festival. There's a band called the Rocky atheist band. And I'm playing the Rocky atheist blues guitar player. I'm playing with a couple Man. of songs. It'd be fun to be on stage again. Stage wall. So if you're in Dallas at the Dallas Market Center at 2200 North Stemmons Freeway, I will be there with the Rocky Eighth Band. Uh, Man, I wish I could get out there. Early though, guys and girls, we're on at 12:30 in the afternoon. Just let you all know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know I, I had uh, Don Daneman on the show from the Circle, and um, I. I I told him, you know, we had went to go see Judas Priest just a few weeks ago. And uh, I noticed that the crowd was, you know, my age or a little older. And uh, people were kind of looking at their watches. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, our managers, they uh, they have us 
booked early shows because uh you know that that crowd tends and wants to go to bed a little early <laughs> well you know we used to play with with, with uh, zz top a lot in the european festivals i remember one day we'd get there and, and uh, Z, it's, it's a huge festival bill and we we're on at uh, zz's on at 10 we're on at eight they're closing the show and then all of a sudden we get word up and it says would you guys mind closing the show and it doesn't matter to us so i thought that it probably went like this Billy probably said, uh, you know, 10 o'clock is a little late. <laughs> I might be late to one. You think Twisted would change with us, you know, so we could be done at 10? You think that? <laughs> I think that's how that conversation went. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, Billy, no problem. We'll close the show. But I'm sure Billy just wanted to get to bed at an earlier time, man. That's our new, that's our reality, right? That's our new, that's our new reality, man. And I used to be able to stay up all night. Now I'm lucky if I make it past 930. <laughs> you know, people always say to me, they go, hey, man, you look like you're 50. I say, I may look like I'm 50, but it's 7 a.m. Motherfucker, I am 70. <laughs> 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 you know, you know, what our, you know what our motto is now? Sex for <laughs> drugs and rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> You know, used to be cocaine, mescaline. Now it's like metaprolol, avastatin. <laughs> I got uh, a, a torvastatin, a metformin, glipizide. Those. Yeah, people come over and I'm like, "Hey, you want to do some drugs? I got some metformin here. <laughs> you bring your sugar down." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you want to steal the lie, bro? <laughs> like, we were in a dressing room years ago. It was us and and uh, it was quiet riot and Theo and uh, and I'm listening to the conversation. You know, like everyone's like in a room, you know, talking before the show, and I'm hearing like, so you go, what's your PSA number? Oh, you're going in for your colonoscopy, and like I'm, I'm saying to myself, it sounds like my, a waiting room in Boca, you know, with my aunt, my uncle, or my grandparent. <laughs> you know, it sounds like a, a Jewish waiting room in Boca. What the hell are they talking about? Man? Oh my God, we're all we're all heading in that direction. <laughs> so listen, let me just say this before I get out of here: a couple of things. I have a podcast called the JJ French Connection. For people who want to listen to it, J Y J A Y F R E N C H, the JJ French Connection Beyond the Music. It's available on Apple and I and all the other you know podcasts. One and Spotify. I also write for two magazines: uh, Goldmine Magazine and Copper. These are Gold Mines a record collector magazine, so I write a Beatle column for Gold Mines, a Beatleologist. And uh, I, uh, I write an audio column for Copper, which can be a good uh, Copper magazine, PS Audio. PS Audio is a audio high-end manufacturer. They happen to make a magazine called Copper. I write an article for Copper. And I also do motivational speaking. Okay. And I'm going to give, give you guys uh, an email address so you can even write to me. I actually answer this email. So if you're interested in either hiring me Give me a comment on my book or have a suggestion for my podcast or anything else. It's ask JJ. Simple. Ask JJ, J A Y J A Y, ask JJ T S, which was ask JJ T S at Gmail. If you send me an email at ask JJ T S, I will respond to that email. If you want to tell me that you saw the band back in 1984 or that you named your kid after my guitar player or that your daughter looks like D, God help you. But, you know, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> um so uh no seriously if you want to contact me do it through that way or uh or uh, uh listen to my podcast read my articles hire me get my book the book is important twisted business on amazon it really is and it's it's a, it's a template book so meaning it'll give you some great uh, suggestions on how to make your business more successful maybe how to make your life more successful too i am so grateful to you for having me on. Oh, yes. For sharing with me some of your personal stories as well. So thank Maybe. you. Life does not go by unscarred, my friend. No one's life does. Well, it's been an honor to have you on the show. Uh, I really, really appreciate your time. All of you out there, if you are new to the channel, I want to thank you for stopping by and please subscribe. Um, if you're a regular, I, I really appreciate your support because it's because of you. We do what we do. So until the next one, everyone, please take care and be kind to one another. God bless and peace. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen to the Vibes. You can catch us on Buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. 
and on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook at The Vibes Broadcast Network.